concepts are part of what's called formal logic. Formal logic is mathematical. Conditional statements are usually of the form if then. If this happens, then that will happen. So they're usually describing a cause and effect relationship. If you clean your room, then you will get your allowance kind of a thing. So typically they're in that form, if this, then that. Or they could be in the form, you'll get your allowance if you clean your room. It's the same idea though, right? If you clean your room, you'll get your allowance. You'll get your allowance if you clean your room. The if is the same part. This is the most common. This happens occasionally. The hypothesis is the unproven theory, a proposition, or supposition. What's that say, the one with purple? Q, if, P. Okay. So it's kind of the, it's the same statement, but just sort of written backwards. So a proposition. The proposition is you're going to clean your room. Or that's a supposition. You're going to clean your room. The hypothesis is the part that comes after the word if. The conclusion is the last step in a reasoning process. It's also the then part of the conditional statement. The conclusion of you cleaning your room is that you'll get allowance. Plus you'll have a nice clean room, right? Okay. Conditional statements may or may not be true. A counterexample shows a conditional statement is false. So if I say, if you clean your room, you always get allowance. You know, if you clean your room, then you always get allowance. And you say, uh, no, that one time I cleaned my room and you did not give me allowance, that's a counterexample. That makes the statement false. So if you can prove the conclusion is false, the whole statement is false. So examples of a conditional statement, if you study, then you will pass the test. The hypothesis is the part that comes after if. So the hypothesis on this is you study. The conclusion is the part that comes after the then. So the conclusion is you will pass the test. And a counterexample is something that proves the statement false. And you only have to find one example of the statement being false, and then it's never true. So the counterexample is that you studied and failed. If you studied and you failed, this statement, this conditional statement, if you study, then you will pass the test, is never true. Yes, you might study and pass the test, but this, stint, this statement is not true. It has to be true for every single instance for it to be a true statement. It can be true sometimes, but that doesn't make it an overall true statement, if that makes sense. We have the conditional statement, which is the if, P, then Q. So if you clean your room, then you'll get allowance. A converse switches them. So if you get allowance, then you cleaned your room. So it turns, the con it turns the hypothesis into the conclusion, and it turns the conclusion into the hypothesis. It changes them. So flipped. The statement has been flipped. The front and back have changed places. Biconditionals occur if a true conditional so we can't find any counterexamples for it. It's always true. And then we flip the order. And the converse, this part, is also always true. Then you get a biconditional. And they contain the phrase, if and only if. So let's say there's never an example where you clean your room and you don't get allowance. If I flip it around, I so if I say, if you clean your room, then you get allowance. And that's always true. And then I say, 
if you got allowance, then you cleaned your room. And that's always true. I can say, you get allowance if and only if you clean your room. The symbol for if and only if, so we don't have to write it all out all the time, is IFF, -F, two Fs. That means if and only if. On converse, yeah. Yeah, so on converse we flip them. On an inverse, we negate them. So on an inverse, instead of flipping them or anything, we say if you don't clean your room, then you don't get allowance. We make both sent parts negative. So if not this, then not that. So we negate them. And then a contrapositive happens when you do both. You flip them and you negate them. So flipped was if you got allowance, then you cleaned your room. Negative was if you don't clean your room, then you don't get allowance. Well, if I do both, if you don't get allowance, you didn't clean your room. So this is both. Flipped and negate. IFF, this is the shorthand for this phrase. This means if and only if. So you don't have to write out all those words. So conditional statements are just the normal if something, then something else. Converse changes the order, so you flip them. Inverse makes them negative, so you throw nots and don'ts in there. And then contrapositive is where you do both. You make them negative and you flip them. My conditional statement is if a triangle has two congruent sides, then it is isosceles and converse switches the order. So I change the order to if a triangle is isosceles, then it has two congruent sides. Okay, so as you can see, I just took what was in the beginning and put it at the end and took what was the end and put it at the beginning. So I flipped them. Okay. These are both true. If a triangle has two congruent sides, it is isosceles. That's true. If a triangle is isosceles, it has two congruent sides. That is true. Because they're both true, I can make a biconditional. A triangle is isosceles if and only if it has two congruent sides. So this if IFF is if and only if. And the only reason I was able to make that biconditional is because this is true and this is true. Now inverse statements have the same truth value as a conditional. So we should write that down. This is not the case. If a, a, con a conditional might be true and a converse would be, still be false, that can happen. But if a conditional is true, then the inverse is true. And if the conditional is false, the inverse is false. Conditionals and inverse are the same truth value. So an inverse of this would be I'm going to make it negative. So if a triangle does not have two congruent sides, then it is not isosceles. Okay, so same order, but I threw nots and don'ts and doesn't negative things in there. And finally, on the contrapositive, it's negative and flipped. So if a triangle is not 
isosceles, then it does not have two congruent sides. And again, the contrapositive may or may not be true. A converse may or may not be true. It just depends on your... So we need to be able to identify hypotheses and conclusions. Hypotheses come after the word if. Hypothesis. Conclusions come after the word then, or there are whatever parts left over after the if part has been identified. Sometimes they're at the beginning. Okay. This might or might not be true. If she does all her homework but she fails all her tests, she didn't get an A in the class, this is a counterexample of that statement. So using the same Marina sentence on your, like right above, so it shouldn't be too hard for you guys. Um, the converse, converse flips. So we had said if Marina does all her homework, then she will get an A, so we're going to flip it. If Marina gets an A, then she did all her homework. Inverse, I make them both negative. So it stays in the same order as the original sentence, but then I make them negative. So if Marina does not do her homework. Then she will not get an A in the class. Okay, and then the contrapositive is where I take the flipped and the negative and I combine them. So if Marina did not get an A, then she did not do all of her homework. And again, any of these may or may not be true. If you can find one example that makes it not true, then it's not true. Find statements that are always true. So I'm going to use one that's painfully obvious. If you were born in Florida, then you are a native Floridian. By definition of a native Floridian, this is true. The converse of that switches the order. If you are a native Floridian, then you were born in Florida. Do you guys agree that both of these statements are 100% true? There is no example that you can find of somebody that was born in Florida that is not a Floridian, not a native Floridian. They might not live here now, but they're considered to be a native Floridian. Wait, what? I'm asking if you agree both of these sentences are true. No, native is where you're born. So if you're born in Florida, you're a native Floridian. If you're born in Georgia, you're a native Georgian. And bless you. They're both true, and only with them both being true. So we agree, true and true. Then I can make a biconditional statement out of it, and I can say you are a native Floridian.
if and only if you were born in Florida, identifying the hypothesis. Hypothesis. Conclusion. That simple. We're going to write the converse again. Converse is flipped. So if I were to flip this, if Sheila is a dog, then she is a terrier. And conditionals and converse don't necessarily have the same truth value. If Sheila is a terrier, then she is a dog. That is true. If you're a terrier, you're a dog. All terriers are dogs. Yes? Mm. But if you're a dog, then you're a terrier? Nope. No. You could be a Doberman. You could be a Rottweiler. You could be a Lab. You could be a Chihuahua. You know? So this one is true. This one is not. Inverses have the same truth value, um, but we negate them. So if it is not raining, then Charlie does not carry an umbrella. So we just make them negative. And then the contrapositive, we do both. We flip and we negate. So if Lauren does not wear a dress, <laughs> then she is not a girl. She could be wearing a skirt. She could be wearing, this is not true, right? I'm saying this is not true. The, and this is, the first part wasn't true either. If Lauren is a girl, then she wears a dress. Not necessarily. There's lots of girls that never wear dresses. And if she does not wear a dress, then she's not a girl. Again, not true. Equality says that if I have two things that equal each other, then I can add the same thing to both sides and I didn't change the value. We use this in solving equations because if I have x minus 3 equals 10, and then I add 3 to both sides, x equals 13. True, true. So I can add the same thing to both sides and I didn't change the value. Or I didn't change the truth. The subtraction property says I can do the same thing except with subtraction. Again, we use this for solving equations. I can subtract two from both sides, or five from both sides, and I get two. Multiplication. We use this, you get things like that. So whenever you see this, we multiply both sides by 5. And if I multiply both sides by 5, it's still true. And if I have something like 3x equals 18, I can divide both sides by 3. And it's still true. As long as I add, subtract, multiply, or divide to the same you know, the same number to both sides, it's still true, and that's the name of the property. And the properties are just, technically, it's the addition property of equality, the subtraction property. But if you just say addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, that's good. So those are the ones that we use to solve algebraic equations. Reflexive property. Reflex, reflexive sounds like reflection, and that's what it is. A equals A. 4 equals 4. 9 equals 9. It's identical on both sides of the equal. It's a reflection. Reflexive property is used in geometry and in math theory when you're writing proofs to introduce new things into the proof because they can't come from nowhere. So if if I needed a 5 in my proof and I didn't have one, I would just throw a line in there that says 5 equals 5, reflexive property. Just It gives me a way to introduce it. Symmetric is what allows us to switch things around to make them look nicer the way we want them to. 
So for example, we get this a lot when we're solving equations and maybe we get like seven equals x and we don't like the way that looks, so we flip it around. We're allowed to do that because the two sides of an equal sign are equal so we can change them. Transitive essentially pulls out the middleman. Do you see we have a equals b and b equals c, that means a equals c. So if I had x equals 2 and 2 equals y, then x equals y. And what I've done is I've eliminated this middleman too. That's what transitive does. So it's transitive because we transition through something else to get to where we want to be. But I like to think of it as we eliminate the middleman. And the transitive property, you'll know transitive because transitive always has this b and b, 2 and 2, you know, 4 plus 1 and 4 plus 1. It's the same thing on either side of the and. That's how you'll recognize transitive property. And substitution, this is a really fancy way of saying if things are equal, we can substitute them in for each other. If x equals 2 and I want to know 5x, well, that's 5 times 2. I can take that 2 and plug it in for the x and substitute it. Commutative property, if you think about your commute, you know, your, your daily commute, you go from home to school, school to home, or home to work, work to home. You go one direction and you turn around and you go back the other direction, at least most people do. That's all commutative property is, we change the direction. So it doesn't matter what order we add in, 2 plus 3 is the same thing as 3 plus 2. 4 times 5 is the same thing as 5 times 4. Commutative property is only true for addition and multiplication. If you're talking about subtraction, the order matters. Same for division, the order matters because 3 minus 2 is not the same thing as 2 minus 3. Associative property, um, associations are groups. So it just doesn't matter what order we add things or what group we add first. If I have 5 plus 5 plus 9. Well, maybe it's easier for me to add 5 plus 5 and then add 9 to it. That's what associative property does. It lets me change which I'm going to add first. Because this is 5 plus 14, which is still not hard, but maybe if there were bigger numbers. But this is 10 plus 9, and 10 plus 9 is still easier than 5 plus 14. Same thing with multiplication. 2 times 5 times 17. Well, 2 times 5 is 10, times 17 is 170. So changing that grouping makes the problem easier. That's what associative property is useful for. And then distributive property just gets used a whole lot. So if I have 3 times x minus 6, that is the same thing as 3x minus 18. Now if you multiply in to get 3x minus 18, or if you go from 3x minus 18 and you divide the 3 out, these are both called the distributive property, either way. So if you start here and move here, or if you start here and move here. That's still called distributive property. Even though we usually call this factoring when we factor things out, but it's still the distributive property. To identify the properties, you look at either side of the equal and see what changed. So on our first example, 10 equals 10, nothing changed. It's exactly the same, so that's reflective. Reflect, not reflective, reflexive, sorry. Okay. If I look at B, I have 3 plus 2 plus 1, 3 plus 2 plus 1. The order is the same. The only thing that moved were the parentheses, so that's commutative. I'm sorry, not commutative. Jeez, associative. 
Now, don't look at this and always go, oh, parentheses, it's associative, because you could have something like this, where I have 3 plus 2 plus 1 is equal to 2 plus 1 plus 3. It might appear that my parentheses are the only thing that moved, but see how this is 3, 2, 1, and this is 2, 1, 3? Here the order changed. And if the order changes, it's commutative. Do you see the difference? So just be really careful of that. Uh, 11 plus 5 is equal to 5 plus 11. That's an order change, so that's commutative. Okay. If 1 equals 5 minus 4 and 5 minus 4 equals 2, I have 5 minus 4 and 5 minus 4. And then those go away, and I get 1 equals 2 minus 1. When that happens, that's transitive. And 2x plus 5 equals 27. Well, what did I do? I had subtracted 5 from both sides, or that's what happened. 5 was subtracted from both sides, so that's subtraction. Deductive reasoning is a process of using facts, like hard facts to come to a conclusion. Math is deductive reasoning. We use known facts and theories and we move through those to get to a conclusion. Inductive reasoning is where you make conclusions based on patterns that are observed. Sherlock Holmes uses inductive reasoning. He observes things and then makes conclusions. <coughs> Um, inductive reasoning would be like if you notice every day somebody has Starbucks coffee cup, you would conclude that they really like Starbucks coffee. It may or may not be true, but it's based on your observations. Like they may get Starbucks just because on their way to work. Or maybe they're getting tea and it's just you can't tell because it's in the Starbucks cup. Maybe they really like Starbucks tea, not coffee, right? <laughs> But deductive reasoning would be if you worked at Starbucks and the same person came in every day and ordered Starbucks coffee and said, oh my God, I love Starbucks coffee. That's a fact and then you would make the conclusion that they really love Starbucks coffee based on actual facts that you know. That you know. So that's the difference between the two. Math uses deductive reasoning more often than inductive. Solve this equation. The first thing we do is we distribute the 3. So we get 3x plus 6 equals 15. Then we subtract 6 from both sides. So we get 3x equals 9. Then we divide both sides by 3. So we get x equals 3. We have concluded that x equals 3 based on mathematical facts. We're allowed to distribute, we're allowed to subtract, we're allowed to divide. These are facts. We can take this and we can turn it into a proof. These are the easiest type of proofs to start with because they base on algebraic equations that you can solve easily. So we go to our proof. If we're given 3x, 3 times x plus 2 equals 15 and we're going to prove from that that x equals 3. The first line of your proof or first lines of your proof are always your given statements. So you always write that down first. And the reason, well, the reason is it was given. That's always the first part of a proof. You should always, always get at least this part of the proof complete. Then we come back to our equation. We don't write in these red bits. The next step, we get 3x plus 6 equals 15. Well, we distribute it, so our reason is distribution. Then we had 3x equals 9 because we subtracted. Then we have x equals 3 because we divided. And then at the end of the proof, we write QED because that means this word, words, these words, 
in Latin, which means we showed you what we meant to. It's how, it's how you show that you've ended your proof and you're done. Now, if the given statement is always the first line of your proof, the proof statement is always your last line. Um, this was given, then we added three to both sides, and then what happened? To get from 4x equals 12 to x equals 3, how would you do that? We divided. Okay. Here we have this statement that's given. And I'm skipping this one to last, and I'll show you why. This was given, and then to get from 2 times x plus 8 to 2x plus 16, I multiplied in, right? So I distributed. Okay. And then 16 plus negative 11 gives me 5. That's addition. If you had written subtraction here, I would have also accepted it because 16 minus 11 is 5. And then to get from 2x plus 5 equals 7 to 2x equals 2, I've used subtraction. Okay. B is an interesting one. This is a backwards proof. We're going from an x equals to an equation. So when that happens, you start with your given and then you substitute it into what you're trying to prove. And then you prove that both sides are equal. So it's kind of weird. But you can see they did substitution, then they added 4 plus 3 to get 7, and then how did they get the 14? So 2, yeah, multiplication. So that one's a little strange. It's an unusual one. Uh, first line is always going to be the same word. Okay. Then we added 1 to both sides, so you got addition. And then I had x divided by 2, so to get rid of divided by 2, I multiplication. 